there are a couple things about the title that we put in there. And, and the first thing it talks about authentic leadership skills and how they help with your career progression. And, and I make the differentiation between position leadership skills versus personal leadership skills. You can be given a title and you can be given a certain level of position and with it comes authority, power, whatever. But it may not actually be leadership. And I tend to say, to be authentic and talk about career progression, it needs to be people to people. It needs to be personal power versus position power. So that's one point. And the second point is that leadership sometimes is more of a calling as opposed to a destination. So if you're, you know, have career goals that say, I want to be a CEO or I want to be a superintendent, since some people are here in, in the educational field, if I want to be a superintendent of public schools by the time I'm 35, I'm not sure that's, that's really a, a career goal versus this is the field I want to be in. This is what I want to try to do. And then based upon the skills that I develop and I exhibit, somebody says, you know, you would be better serving as a leader. So it's more of what a calling as opposed to a destination. So a lot of what we're going to be going over today does deal with what constitutes some of the skill sets or elements that help you from, from a standpoint of developing those skills that, that will get you to where you may want to go. Okay? All right. Ah. First off, before we start saying, here's everything you need to do to be successful, I'd really like you to take a look and say, how are you going to measure your success from a career standpoint so that when you're in my position, in a few years, you can look back and say, you know, I did okay. And, and some of these may include such things as, can you take a look at where you've been personal growth wise? Is that a good measurement for a successful career? What about finances? You know, I obtained so, such a level of, of income, uh, stock options, whatever, whatever. I got the power and position that I always wanted to have where I could give the orders and, and expect people to follow. Matter of fact, that, that doesn't work anyway. Um, the recognition aspect that I'm being recognized by people in my, my peers and the people that I work for, my authority level, and has a span of my authority increased as I've gone through my career. And then final, personal satisfaction. During your career, you may actually achieve all of these as far as outcomes. But as far as how you measure success, I would challenge you that personal growth and personal satisfaction are really the two measurements that you should focus in on. The others will come if you are doing those. Now the other flip side of the coin is, what's the price you're willing to pay to get there? Because maybe it's continuing to write a lot of papers, as some people in the room suggested that they, they have a lot of that to take place. Long hours, what are you willing to commit? Time away from your family and friends, because again, I'm gonna, what am I gonna dedicate it to? Responsibility and accountability, because I may get that level of position, but with that comes what? Responsibility, accountability as well. Be sure you, be careful what you're asking for. The personal sacrifices that you may have to put in place. Job and company changes, because if you have an idea that I want to achieve a certain level or where I, I think I can have my skills better utilized, it may force me to do what? Change the, the organizations that I work with because the, the ones I'm with now may not be able to offer me that type of opportunity. Travel and location moves. Challenge to your principles. I would say to you, all of these are important as you take a look at them. But if you're ever having a position or put in a position where your principles or values are challenged from a standpoint of what you're being asked to do, I think you may take a look and say, hey, maybe it's time to make a change. Never give up on those. Also risk and failures. To make progress, sometimes you're gonna to have to take risk and sometimes there'll be failures, maybe some setbacks where you have to go parallel for a period of time before you can go forward. So. What I tell people is, all right, find the balance of what you're really wanting to go for and what you're willing to sacrifice to get there. And what I'll tell you is that that may also change over time. A uh, personal example, 
in my early 30s, I was uh, given an opportunity to take a position that offered, at that time, one heck of a financial type of deal. And also more prestige, more responsibility, got the title or whatever. But it required 60% travel overseas, which sometimes, maybe at a certain stage of life, that's pretty good. We had three kids under the age of seven, and the dads can be gone 70% of the time. Didn't take it because I had different principles, values, whatever, at that particular time. When I got to my 50s, I was given a chance to take on a global HR leadership position, entailed a lot of travel, a lot of, of rewards and recognition, a lot of you know, challenges that were new to me in a sense, but you know, that's okay. Kids were grown. We were wherever we were. They were spread throughout the country. I took the position because it was a different time, different phase of the life. So the same criteria didn't apply. So that's what I'm trying to say is find the balance, but realize things change. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is go through what we consider and, and what I consider some of the key elements that will help you in your authentic leadership become a better leader, but also those particular things also can be utilized to help your people succeed. Because I think one of the key aspects of, of being an authentic leader is how do you develop your people? How do you grow them? And that is also a measure of success. Now, we have eight elements up here. And what I would challenge you is these are based upon some research because, you know, you don't go through 45 years and not do some research. But when I take a look at that, uh, that career that I've been through and take a look at the people that I had to deal with, those who did not make successful progression usually were missing some of these elements. Those who were successful normally had most of these elements in some degree, one form or fashion to another. So the concept of being a good person, uh, knowing principles and values and knowing the difference between them and how to live by them, being a good communicator, setting directions. And here I have behavior-wise, personal-wise, and also behavior-wise. I'd also put one out there development-wise because you need to have directions on your own development and that of your people. Definitely encourage and address conflict, have a strong orientation to performance, be competent and continually develop your skills, much like hopefully you're getting something out of today. And the one that we're going to put emphasis on today is don't hesitate to establish sound working relationships, both individually and yourself with groups. And I think that you'll see that by, by taking a look at these and how they combine, pretty good blueprint on, on what's needed to make progress in a career. What I'll be doing is going through each of those briefly and, but then spending a lot more time on the last one about developing relationships. Prior to doing that though, I'd like to share some literature or at least some, some thoughts about leadership thoughts and such. Uh, first one is by a guy here right in Charlotte, uh, John Young. Uh, John's an industrial uh, psychologist and such, worked with a lot of companies. I've had time to work with him as well. And, and he has a very humanistic approach to leadership. And his favorite saying is, when you accept money from a company purportedly to be a leader, you give up the right to be ignorant about the impact you have on people. So think about that. I can have all the results in the world. I can have the uh, you know, recognition for myself and such. But if I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing and having an impact on people, then my results may be shortchanged. Then if you take a look at any of the various leadership models that are out there, and mine go back to you know, Phil Cosby and, and some of those type of people, Michael Hammer, who has a book back here in the back, uh, and a few others, uh, Stephen Covey, all those type of searches. If you take a look at them, most of them will have something that to be an effective leader, there has to be what, a people-centered type of environment, okay? So having the belief in people, uh, demonstrating that, that you have conviction and compassion for them, communication, development, eliminating barriers that get in the way of them uh, being successful, 
and definitely the aspect of recognizing. So a lot of these, again, talk about what? People-centered type of skills. Then if you take a look at the high-performance team characteristics, and this is by a guy named uh, John Kotzenbach in a book, Wisdom of Teams. And he talks about the criteria that, that, that makes a high-performance team. And again, if you take a look at certain uh, parts of it, a lot of it deals with people. So such things as having the right set of skills as far as in a team, you need to have people that have a technical background in that topic area. You need somebody on there that's a good problem solver. You also need people in there that have the interpersonal skills that are able to get the team over the bumps which are there. Also for a good team, there needs to be mutual accountability. It's not finger pointing. We either all successful or we didn't quite get where we needed to be. And then finally committed to each other's what? Personal growth and success. So all these to me point to the aspect that we have to have what? A strong orientation towards people. So a lot of those eight elements that, that I'm gonna cover do what? Focus on the people side of the skills that a leader has to have so that they can be uh, the leader that's needed. The first one, talks about what does it mean to be a good person. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because we could spend all day about what it takes. But it does say to me that you're not talking about perfection. You're not talking about we're going to put you up for sainthood. We're talking about recognizing, your, again, your impact on people and how you go forward in dealing with people. It talks about not being self-centered or egotistical. It does say that, hey, you can be, what, ambitious and self-confident. And, and I have three aspects up here. Uh, Doreen Gray. Anybody ever read Doreen Gray? Yeah, the picture of Doreen Gray. Gets into ego, gets into ambition, deals with that. So if you don't remember it, read it sometime. This is the part that I show that there's I have some intellect to me, so I've actually read books. That was in high school, but anyway. Um, the Goose Poop Chronicles are something that, that I deal with my grandkids because you can talk to them on terms of, because they come to our river place and a lot of geese, so we have the saying such as, don't step in the goose poop, okay? And also, don't be a goose pooper, meaning that don't create messes for other people to what? Step in or have to clean up. And that's an adage that I put to leaders as well. If you make mistakes, admit to it and clean up your own messes. And then finally, um, the poem. All I ever need to know, I learned in kindergarten. It's old. Uh, I'm seeing eyes. Have you read it? No, we have an internal joke about that. <laughs> okay. I suggest you read it, and if you can look at it and say, you know, that's pretty true, and I'm doing okay by it, then you have a pretty good grasp of being a good person. Okay? The second element is knowing your principles and values and live by them. And you can read the definitions up here. Uh, a principle is pretty much, to me, Set in stone, it's a moral belief or rule that helps you know right from wrong and it influences your actions. I'd also say that a principle is usually universal. Most people know about it. Most people have heard about it. Values are those things that drive behaviors. They're those things so valuable to me as a person that it impacts me from what? Both a conscious as well as a subconscious type of approach. Now, can a value and a principle be the same? Can I have a value that is also a principle? The answer is yes. But sometimes they may not always agree. Again, let me give you a couple examples. In my family, uh, we, I grew up as a, as a plumber's son before plumbers made a lot of money. Um, but. I don't know about you, but was I a snotty-nosed teenager at one time? Yeah. And did I ever get, you know, 
you know, after my dad in the sense of, boy, I wish I really had this, like my friends had, or whatever, you know, I valued those type of possessions. I valued that. Well, he got upset one day with me and said, come. He takes me down to the plumbing firm, opens up the books, because I'd always mentioned what friends had, whatever, whatever. And then he showed me on the books who owed him money and who was back due, you know, some of the same parents. And he made the point, in our family, we value paying our bills on time and being honest with the people that we deal with. Now, do you think that had an impact on changing my value? Yeah, it did. So I, I think that that's, that's a, 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 you know, it changed because that became more authentic to me being able to say, and I've passed that on to my own kids, whatever, you be responsible for your finances and such. Now, it may not be a golden principle, but it is a value that we've established in our family. Now, early I talked about never be put in a position where your principles are questioned. And I had the opportunity, it was a good opportunity, I could have really gotten ahead in that particular organization. But I was hired, I was working with a leader who was very good in, in, in certain areas, but this is the early 80s, and uh, he harassed female employees in that area. I mean, he was a lecherous old fool. I'll just put it that way. And I went and talked to the people in human resources saying, hey, look what's going on. And that, you know, their, their feedback to me was, look, we know, but he's gonna retire in a couple of years and that's gonna be your position. I was gone within six months of that time period. Now I didn't you know, quit right on the spot because I was gonna take care of myself and my family. But I could not, in all honesty, what, stay there? My principles were being conflicted with. So all I ask that you do is know your principles, know your values, be sure they have some alignment, and you live by them. And that sets a good standard for you as you work with the people that you have to deal with. To me, that's the cr true creation of authenticity. Talk about being a good communicator. And here, I am getting away from this, uh, you know, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever, not communication. You need to have the person-to-person -person type communication skills that I think we will all want to have. So up, down, lateral. I need to be able to talk to those people I report to. I need to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with my my colleagues, I need to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the people that I'm responsible for and to groups. It needs to be what? People-to-people -people type communication. Now, when I talk of communication, it's the transmission of information with emotion, with feeling, and at that point, is it communication? No, not. Until there is mutual understanding you may not agree with what I say, but you have an understanding of what I'm saying and all the nonverbal that goes with it. That is what I mean by people-to-people -people communication. Here I talk about setting directions. If you don't know where you're going, any road might get you there or you may never get anywhere. So you have to be able to talk about setting directions business-wise, uh, in your personal life, behavior-wise, if you see an area you have to work on there. And then also, I talk about the development aspect that you have to have. So have an idea of where you want to go and how you're going to get there. And also, as you take a look at all those areas, remember how I talked about I had this, the family situation where, in one sense, you know, I could take a position, but I didn't because of, well, that, that, that was a matter of, it set me back a little bit because, you know, but I had to have what? Patience and perseverance and stay with it. You also need to demonstrate some initiative and curiosity as you're setting these directions. But there needs to be looking at these in balance with each other again. From a standpoint, if I'm setting directions business-wise for myself and my people, I also have to take a look at where I am family-wise, my personal life. They have to have some balance and same thing with my development plan. 
it has to support what I'm trying to do. So you have to look at all three aspects. Okay, encourage and address conflict. Huh. Why would I put that as a leadership element? Okay, that, that's the open question that's, that, that it's wants, there. yeah. Because yeah. it's there whether or not you address it. Yeah, but encourage it? Okay, not all conflict is bad. No, no, it's not. Anybody else? For growth. For growth, yeah. What I allude to here as far as encouraging from a leadership standpoint is if all we are doing in whatever we are responsible for, whether it be an in industry, manufacturing, business, education, whatever, if all we're trying to do is maintain the status quo, Somebody else is passing this. So anytime that I'm going to be getting into how am I going to improve things within my work area, which may be good for people, really may be, for their good interest and such as that, I'm probably going to be what? Creating conflict. Because change, it's not a matter of whether it's good or bad change. It's change. And people resist change. And therefore it leads to what? Conflict. But I also say for a leader, you know, being able to encourage that, it has some benefits for you. If addressed in a timely manner, it brings the issues to the forefront so they may be addressed, and I say, in a timely manner. Because no matter what you do, if you ignore, you know, time heals all, no. Time doesn't heal all. Because what you'll see is if there's really conflict where it has gotten to the point that it is impacting people from an emotional standpoint, they may hide it, but it may fester and whatever. And normally it's going to come up at the most inopportune time. And you're going to have to take more of your personal energy, resources, and time trying to resolve it. If you do it in a timely manner, it can release tension in the workplace and actually helps to reduce stress that's out there. I actually had one company that I worked with where we had two people in a department who at some time in their careers had crossed paths with each other in a negative way and other than actually having to, here, here's a piece of paper for you, or at that time it was paper, um, not an email because they'd have used emails if they could have. But they hadn't really spoken person to person in 10 years. That's how long it had gone on. And, and it was really hurting the department and hurting them as well. So timely manner. And sometimes it just revitalizes a relationship because if you don't know what's going on, then you may not realize I've stepped on somebody's toe. Remember I talked about the leader who recognizes they've made a mistake and such? And then they have to what? Clean up their mistakes? Okay. If I've done some things as a leader that have impacted my people negatively and I find it reveals the problem, then I can what? Address it. So there's a whole concept of valuing conflict and being a good person at resolving conflict to me is a key element to be an authentic leader. I think any leader has to have a strong orientation to performance. But there are various aspects of performance. Normally you talk about performance and people automatically go to where? Results. Did you hit the numbers? Did you hit budget? What are some of the measures, let's say, in the educational area? Tests, uh, assessments. Scores. Yeah, scores and quizzes and exams. Okay, that's of the participants. Mm -hmm. What about you? Um, student success rates. All right, okay. student success rates, okay. Uh, maybe it's also such things as uh, career success of the students as far as finding positions and such. Publishing um, also, articles. Hmm? Publishing. Publishing, yeah. yeah. Right. Faculty evaluation scores. Faculty evaluation scores, okay. So there are some aspects of results, okay? Numbers. What we'd also say as part of the performance aspect is it also has to be behaviors. What behaviors were utilized to obtain the results? If you have a person who gets results 
at the expense of the people that they work with or work for. You know, we use the analogy of how many bodies have they laid by the wayside. Then that's, that's the negative aspect. Again, if I'm the authentic leader, I need to get results using what? The right behaviors with the people that I'm dealing with. And another aspect of it is, in today's ever-changing work environment, and we'll get into it in a minute, the whole concept of knowledge and the exponential growth of knowledge says that I'm going to continually have to develop my people and myself. So when I take a look at the performance process, it's not only getting results, it's using the behaviors and being sure my people have the skill sets and knowledge base to be successful. Be competent and continually develop your skill sets. Another element. And I almost mentioned this a minute ago, talking about the exponential growth, the last time I looked it up. The whole base of knowledge is doubling itself every 12 months. And if you're standing on what you know today and do not advance your knowledge, I would challenge you that you'd be obsolete in two years in today's marketplace. I think you need to be curious out there in your present field and also new areas of interest. You're continually learning, exploring, and such as that. Now, right now, a lot of my time and effort is being spent on some of the organizations I'm supporting in a retired type of life. Uh, there's one group that's a naturalist organization in the Blue Ridge called the Blue Ridge Discovery Center. So I'm gaining a lot of knowledge and conservation and those type of aspects. It's neat. It's still good to learn. But what I would challenge you on this is understanding you're just not looking at yourself. If your knowledge is obsolete within two years, maybe your position will be obsolete within two years. So you need to be continually looking at it from that standpoint. That's the reason I'm talking about being curious out there about what's new, what's ever. But you also need to be thinking about your people as well. How are you continually developing them so they have potential success for the future as well. I'm told not to back up or you'll get the ball spot and with the lights up here, you'll go blind. <laughs> this is something I've put together over the years and it talks about the fact that there's different ways that people learn. And as you put together your continuous education and such, you need to take a look at are there new methodologies out there that can help me learn more, faster, quicker. I would also challenge you to this particular aspect of reality. And I'll give my personal experience that in my organizations, we always push for people to have development plans. And the number one thing that everybody does is I want to go to this conference. And then you add up all the expense of all, I want to go to this conferences, and pretty soon your organization no longer has a profit. All I'm saying is you have to take a look that there are different ways to learn things and if, if we don't have the resources to do this, there are other ways to go about it. You cannot rest on that fact of, oh, the company said they want to develop me, but they aren't willing to back it up. You have some responsibility. Matter of fact, I challenge every one of you saying your personal development is whose responsibility? Mm -hmm. Yours. So you have to... Keep doing that. Notice I'm backing up so you don't get it. I'm getting better. <laughs> now I'd like to spend some time talking about don't hesitate to establish sound working relationships. And I go at it both from an individual standpoint as well as a group standpoint. And I, I can honestly say I don't know of any situation that doesn't dictate relationship development. If you go back to where I talked about some of the leadership aspects and the people aspects, all it is about is developing relationships. So I really, really want to put some emphasis on there. And matter of fact, I would challenge you to think of all of the elements we've discussed in terms of aren't they part of developing relationships? Resolving conflict, communication, setting directions. All that's part of the, what, developing relationships with the people that, I'm, that I have with me. So what I'm going to do, and this is where we get some involvement, is to talk about the types of relationships we should strive for 
and then spend some time on how do we develop these types of relationships? What are some of the tools that you can utilize? So first off, let's talk about the types of relationships we want to have. You can call them goals or criteria, but the first one I would like to hit on is the fact that in any relationship that you have, it should be dynamic. By dynamic, I'm saying that there's a constant what? Interchange. Giving and taking to the relationship. Anybody here in a serious relationship, a significant other type of relationship? Okay. Anybody who says like marriage is 50-50, they're crazy. Because there have been times when I know it was 80-20, and I was the one giving the 80. You, you know that, right? No. <laughs> but it's the fact that it has to balance out over a period of time, but it is a dynamic relationship. It is a living people-to-people -people type of relationship. The second aspect that I would say about the relationship, it needs to be long-term. At least you need to go into it with the mindset that it's going to be a long-term relationship. In today's complex work environment that has international intrigue to it, global aspects of it, you may say, you know, people aren't in the long, you know, I'm not going to be with them that long, so why do I have to take it? What I would tell you is that the reason that I emphasize you go into it with the long-term aspect is the fact that if I'm thinking that way, I go at it a different approach if I know that it's just going to be a, oh, three weeks and you're done type of thing or two years and it's done. I look at it differently. If I'm saying I want to try this from a standpoint, I'm going to be working with you for the next five, six years. A lot of different mental aspect. Mutual benefit. If you're not getting something out of it, then why are you in it? So both parties, all parties, have to get something out of it that says to them, this is worthwhile. This is okay. I need to do this. This is what I want to do. Then finally is the fact that it is a relationship. It is not position to position, but what? People to people, person to person. So if you can remember those aspects of it, dynamic, long-term, mutual benefit relationship, that's a pretty good you know, set of criteria by which to measure how well you're going at it. Now, going back to the global aspect that I mentioned as far as complexity, whatever else, and I don't know if they're still doing it, but in my company, the last one, again, global company, uh, my division had eight locations throughout the world. And I had to go and learn the cultures and all that stuff. It was pretty good stuff. Um, but what we did, we had three divisions, multiple locations. We had what I called a leadership symposium in which we would bring the execs in, whatever, and from a certain level up, and we would have some instruction and such. But you know, one of the reasons we brought them together was starting to what? Develop the relationships. Before, uh, and I got to preface that a little bit, Prior to a certain date, the ownership did not want the divisions talking to each other. So these people had not established relationships. Don't understand why. But then they changed saying, you know, we really need these people to what? Share expertise, work together. So the leadership symposium, one, yes, we wanted them to have some knowledge, skills out of that. But really, it was starting to help them what? Develop those type of relationships. The second thing is uh, I had responsibilities for aspiring type of leaders, those that we identified that had the potential to be leaders. Remember I talked about a calling as opposed to a destination? You know, sometimes companies are looking out there saying, all right, who are the next crew of people that we think have that potential? So I put together a 16-month development process that each quarter we would have these international aspiring leaders come together for two to three days. Again, most of it was dealing with developing relationships. And we'd give them some cross-divisional projects that they would have to work on after they left. So again, I was trying to get through some of these aspects. And then finally, from a standpoint of the relationship development, we would have coaching and mentoring of the people so that uh, it had the follow-through to be sure they understood the importance of the relationships. 
So it was a very, what, deliberate approach that we utilized trying to get at this very thing so that we had the leaders that we needed. One of the concepts that I'd like to bring forth as far as with this is the concept talking about the internal ledger. Because I think if you realize that it's a constant, what, giving and taking, that you're keeping track of what you give to a relationship and what you get out of it. Now, that may sound cruel or it may sound, oh, boy, that is callous. But it's reality. Uh, this afternoon, when you're leaving the parking lot and, and you're pulling out in traffic, if somebody lets you out in front of them because it's backed up, or maybe it's you let somebody in front of you, do you expect anything in return? No. Do you expect a nod of the head or a wave of the hand? Okay, tomorrow, the same time, same place. And again, this person is, is coming out in front of you. Do you let them? I bet you after around three or four times, no, you don't. Because we do measure things. We do. Uh, same thing in the grocery line. If, if I let somebody, you know, they have three items and I have a basket full, do I expect a thank you or a nod of the head or something? Yeah, it's not a big investment, let's put it that way. But we are expecting, and over a period of time, we take a look at how we are in a relationship from a standpoint of what we're giving to it as well as what we're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go through a couple examples here that, that uh, play into place. All right, working relationship. We're taking a look at you and your leader. What do you give to the relationship that you have with your leader? What are you giving to that relationship? Okay. All right, time's there. Hard work. Hard work, okay. Commitment. Commitment, okay. Contributions. Contributions, yeah. Anything else? Ideas. Ideas, all of those, right? Some of them I put up there included, all right, many of yours. You're giving your knowledge, your skills, effort. Now, nobody hit on, I'm giving them performance. You can put all the knowledge and skills out there, but if you're not achieving what? Performance in the sense of results and behaviors, then it may not be as positive as what you thought. Definitely, initiative, ideas, and the positive behaviors. You're giving them time. Do you give your leader feedback? Yes. Hopefully you have a relationship where you think you can, you know, you got to learn that over a period of time. To what level of leadership can I give feedback to? But, all right, here's feedback. Uh, what about on the other side? What do you expect from your leader in terms of contributing to the relationship with you? Money. Okay, we put money, rewards, yeah. Encouragement. Encouragement, yeah. Understanding. Understanding. Feedback. Feedback, yeah, it's two ways there. And I would also say, whereas some of us would say, the only time I want to tell that son of a gun how he's doing is when he's doing good by me. Whereas we know that we're going to hear both the good and the bad coming from the other direction. Maybe, okay. What else? Protection. Protection? Explain. So if something goes wrong, you expect your leader to back you up or to be there to, to be neutral in what's going on, not just attack. Okay, okay. Get through the facts, resolve the conflict. Uh, if there are corrective actions needed, also doing that. Yeah. yeah. So they also provide what? Opportunity, coaching. That's part of that feedback development opportunities so that you can grow. Rewards and recognition, feedback. Now, if I count, I think there are eight things on the left and maybe five or six things on the right. Is that a balanced relationship? Kind of. I mean, it's eight, I mean you're giving eight things, you're only getting back six, is that balanced? 
don't go by the numbers. Yeah, it, depends on it. it depends on what the value of each of those contributions is to the relationship. Okay. Now, something nobody brought up dealt with loyalty and job security. Are you loyal to your company and to your leader? And in return, do you expect job security? We're seeing that that's much more difficult in today's type of environment, that the only way that you can helpfully assure your job security is what? Results and continuing to what? Progress and helping the organization. People who stay in the same position doing the same thing and don't keep themselves current and progressing will become outdated and, you know, got to have questions about what, what do they bring. Okay. So the question, are they in balance? I think we are sure that maybe they are. But let's take a look at maybe you and your colleagues. What do you give to your, your cohorts? Friendship? Could be. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Feedback too. Feedback? Yeah. Collaboration. Collaboration, if it's dictated or needed. Well, dictated in the right word. <laughs> Hopefully we, we collaborate whether it's dictated or not because we need to be able to work together. We share knowledge. Hopefully. We share skills. Hopefully we share our experiences because a lot of knowledge comes from experiences. Support, which somebody mentioned. Positive behaviors. Collaboration. We give time to it. Feedback, plus and minus. No, so we do that with our colleagues. We not do it with the with the with the, the leader, and friendship. What do you expect in return? The same. The same. The same thing. Basically, same things. All right. Hopefully, they share the knowledge, share their skills. Oh, in this case, maybe this person didn't share any of their experiences. We'll come back to that. We probably so, don't want the negative feedback either. <laughs> We don't call it negative, we'll call it constructive, okay? Because that's part of the collaboration aspect. Time, feedback, plus or minus, and then also maybe not friendship. Could this be a balanced relationship? Yeah, I think yes. so. Yes, it can. Maybe this is a new person, new to the field, don't have a lot of what? Work experience to share. But they're still doing the best they can. Also, if they're a new person and you've been there a while, friendship may evolve. But we're talking about sound working relationships and friendship doesn't necessarily have to be an ingredient. It's nice. And we'll take a look at levels of, of relationships and see where they go. But in essence, you know, maybe this person's very private and yeah, they work, cooperate, but they're very private. So it shouldn't be taken as what? An X mark saying, no, we don't have a good relationship. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Here you are in a highly competitive work environment. You're in similar positions with these people. I'm gonna share my experiences, my knowledge. Hmm? Are you? Am I gonna give them a competitive advantage by sharing things? I am. I hope you do, because you would also expect it in return. Mm -hmm. And depending on how the leader created the environment there, would also help with that to take place. And if you don't, some other company is, and they're going to go ahead. <laughs> yeah. What about a, a leader having friendship with his subordinates? Mm. What do you think? Depends on the nature of it. Okay. That's always going to be a tricky question for you as a leader. What I would say to you is that as long as I am treating my employees fairly and not equally but equitably, then I may have some different types of relationships. I've developed some relationships with subordinates, but we have a very clear understanding up front that there may be times where I have to make difficult decisions that may impact them. And you should never do anything that puts our question of our friendship in, in question. As long as you go at it with that mindset, then okay. Now, this is how things really work. 
go back to the T chart and such as that. I am continually what? Making investments into the relationship. Call them social credits. The other person's making investments, but we're also making what? Withdrawals. And if over a period of time, we see a balance, then we have a good balanced working relationship. If we see an imbalance, then things can go where? Downhill? But let me also say, if I'm working and we have a balanced relationship here, and I think that I would like to grow it, I've got to do what? In some ways, increase what? The value of my investments so that that person reciprocates as well and we grow the relationship. I can't make the same investments day in and day out and expect them to equate to something that somebody else has done for me in, in a larger value. That person that shared their experience with me, that helped me get a new position, gosh, do I owe them something? Probably. It's also important to understand that different levels of relationship dictate what? That we have different levels of investment. The people that I talked about in the grocery line or the car line and such as that, that's a stranger. Maybe I recognize them after the fourth time they pull in front of me. But the fact of it is, is that what? The, the give and take there is very what? Minimal, no great value. But as I go up this, this hierarchy of relationships, then I have to grow the relationship. I'm gonna be making more of those investments we did on the T-charts with my leader, with the people I work with. I'm gonna be giving things to it that are more value. And you can see that working relationships can be pretty, pretty important. And also the aspect of close working relationships and, and friendship, again, much higher. Uh, anybody wants to take a guess at symbiotic? You both benefit from each other. Well, hopefully, no, I'd say but you, going up the line, you should both be benefiting. Symbiotic relationship is the relationship that's taking on almost like the meaning of life. That if you sever the relationship, it's, it's, it's very what, critical and such. Now, I was with a company that its major customer constituted 90% of its business. Now, was that a symbiotic relationship? One direction it was. But how many of you have heard or seen the older couple that had been married for years upon years upon years? One of them dies, and shortly thereafter, the other one passes away as well for no really apparent reason. Their relationship had become symbiotic. Now, I love my wife, but I told her, I'm not going that far, okay? <laughs> Yeah, just, just not. But again, just understand that if I want to grow the relationships, I'm going to have to increase the value of what I'm you know, giving there. Some concepts, and I'll go through these quickly because I still want to give some time. Interdependence. Even though we may believe that we are totally, what, independent, that's a falsehood. We are very interdependent. Even if I'm a single contributor, or individual contributor to my organization. I am depending upon other people giving me information and me as well feeding back information and such as that. So there's always gonna be a level of what? Interdependence within the workplace, within relationships. Secondly, the concept of reciprocity. Just like I can grow a relationship, if we're not maintaining some type of balance in the relationship, over a period of time, if I feel like it's getting out of balance and such, then I will, what, take it down to a level that I feel like it's balanced it out. So just like we can grow it through our mis misbehaviors or misactions and not taking care of the conflict, people will take the relationships down. The people I talked about not talking to each other for 10 years, they taking it down to the bare minimum that they could have and survive. The concept of development over time. Uh, when we're talking about the relationships and friendship, again, looking at the scale on, on where it went, you may say, I want to be a friendship tomorrow. That's not reality. The higher the relationship goes, the longer it will probably take to what to develop it. And you have to be understanding of that. But it also means that people in a relationship have to recognize where they are and where they're wanting to take it 
and actually take that type of uh, comment. Okay, a couple of practices. I talk about auditing a relationship. If you see things going wrong, and this can be mental, it doesn't have to be doing the formal T chart of what you're giving, what you've gotten, but you do need to go through the mental process at times of saying, where are we in this relationship? You know, how are things going? Now, in my particular case, and, and it didn't come automatically, but once I started assuming some leadership roles and such, I had it as, as a stand-in that on a quarterly basis, I was going to get with my employees, and we're not just going to talk about performance. We're going to talk about how things are going between you and I. It was an audit. It was an audit exercise to be sure that I was staying abreast of where we were and things I was doing that could potentially, what, be discord. But also letting them know, hey, I need some aspects from you as well. If you see a relationship and it's, it's not going the way that you want, that you feel like you've invested so much, sometimes you have to do what? Send a bill. Now that may sound, again, callous, but it's actually true. Um, a couple that we uh, associate with, we, we pay cards periodically, and sometimes we're at one house, but we make sure that we don't let it always be that way. We make sure what? Kind of reciprocating so it keeps it in balance, sending a bill. Last story about me. Um, had taken a new position with a company and uh, left my family back here in North Carolina, outside near Wingate, that area, because it's, it's easy to sell a house if it's occupied as opposed to just a vacant house. And anyway, uh, I'd been up there for a month or so and they were still down here. It's getting near when school starts and such, and I call home. And my daughter at the time was four or five, and get on the phone with her, and she says, Dad, I said, yeah, do you love me anymore? And I said, what do you mean? I never see you. I mean, I've been gone for around two months. I made an offer on a house the next day, and that house is still called Keith's house because my wife hated it, but I made an offer. She, my daughter had sent what? She had sent the bill saying, you need to balance this relationship, Dad. You know, I almost felt like I was committing Harry Harry. <laughs> that hurt. But things had gotten out of balance. So sometimes you have to send a bill as well. Now, we've talked a lot about authentic leadership and these particular elements that, that apply to it. And I'd like to also hit on why people fail to progress, because usually it's because they've missed some of those elements. Lack of knowledge, they haven't stayed current. Lack of performance, they haven't gotten the results and they're, or they're using what, poor behaviors. The lack of direction that we talked about. And then I put an emphasis, lack of people-related skills. Again, I can go back through 40 years of experience and, and I can tell you that I can only think of one particular instance in which a person was taken from the organization because they weren't competent. Most of the time, it was always dealing with people-related skills. And I actually had a person that worked for me when I was here that if I took a look at, at her particular knowledge base, she had much better background in human resources than I ever would. She was knowledgeable. She was good. But she had gotten disenchanted with the organization before I got there, of course. Okay. And, and she had just laid bodies along the way. And when it came time that we had to reduce staff, guess what person didn't make it? It was purely because of the people skills. So my emphasis to you is if you take a look at where we've gone, go from here, I don't know if you believe anything I've said today. Hopefully you do. But in essence, if it's not hitting the mark with you as far as these are the things that I need to take a look at as I progress in my career, find some that do. Find yourself a mentor or a coach that they can give you feedback on where you're going and what you're doing. And definitely, you know, I hope that we have an opportunity to meet again in the future and, and we shall see.